But I was a geneticist. I was pretty excited about being a new Christian, so I told a lot of people around me, and about half of them said, well, get ready, your brain's going to explode soon. <laughs> because you have just brought into your worldview a spiritual perspective that is going to absolutely uh, not go along with your scientific profession. So uh, it's very nice uh, that you've made this decision. It probably won't last. Well, it has lasted. I'm glad to say almost 30 years and uh, gotten better and stronger as I've grown in my faith and grown as a scientist and I'm here to tell you that I find absolutely not a shred of conflict between what I know as a scientist and what I believe about Christ uh, as a believer and that surprises a lot of people in the public and in, I think that is unfortunate because the public often only hears about the conflict about the idea that there are just absolutely irreconcilable differences uh, between believers and scientists. And so in a certain way I've been trying to write this book for 25 years and finally uh, I took a little bit of time, probably less than I should have, uh, to write down some of these thoughts. What I want to do tonight is to walk you through, particularly initially from the perspective of science, what we've learned about the genome and then bring that into a discussion about what that tells us about our Creator. Some of this may be uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable for me. But I think we as scientists who are believers are all very much in the mode of believing that God gave us the opportunity to investigate his world. He gave us an intellect. He gave us the kinds of abilities to be able to design tools and technologies to explore the world around us. And as we do so, we're worshiping him. And he, I think, is pleased by that action on our part and the idea that somehow he would be threatened by our puny minds trying to understand how creation works just doesn't make a lot of sense to me and if in the process of discovering aspects of his creation we encounter things that do not absolutely fit with our preconceived notions then we have to struggle with that and we should do so with all great intensity but I don't think we have to worry that somehow truth is going to end up being in conflict with truth God's truth is truth, whether it's spiritual truth or scientific truth. That's what I believe, and that's what I want to try to put forward here this evening, particularly as it comes to the study of DNA, because I think that does shed very important light on a particularly uh, contentious area uh, between uh, science and faith, which is how we all got to be here anyway. Well, with that introduction, which was probably longer than it should be, let me uh, start into this. Uh, description of what we've learned about the genome and of course you've been reading about those things in places like uh, this Time magazine uh, interestingly when they talk about DNA they often use the motif of Adam and Eve or maybe they're just trying to use the motif of naked people because they know that sells magazines <laughs> of course DNA is an instruction book I think if you had to pick a metaphor uh, for this incredible information molecule uh, that's a pretty good metaphor it's certainly the one that I find most useful in talking to non-scientists we each have that instruction book inside each cell of our body it's this incredible 3.1 billion letters in length and every time a cell divides you have to copy the whole thing and as it passes from parent to child most of the time it goes right and once in a while something gets misspelled and of course <clears throat> the instruction book is made up of this wonderful double helix, the DNA molecule, which carries its information capacity in the order of the various letters or bases, uh, which are always paired so that A pairs with T and G pairs with C, a marvelous way then of protecting against damage because if one strand gets damaged you can quickly fix it by using the information on the other strand. And of course, as pointed out by Watson and Crick, this provides a wonderful means of copying. And it, the genome of an organism is all of those base pairs and organisms have genomes of different size that don't necessarily correlate with their biological complexity. Again, ours is 3.1 billion of these letters. And it is an amazing thing to contemplate that we now know that information. We have known it now for about three years. All of the letters of the, our own human instruction book have been sitting on the internet in a place where everybody who has a good idea can be working on it, and they are, furiously. They're now tens of thousands of hits uh, uh, a day uh, on the database where this information is stored and many other browsers also display it and graduate students working in the field of biology 
now cannot imagine how anybody ever did science uh, without having this information. It's just sort of, of course it was always there, wasn't it? Well, it wasn't, but it is now. And I think one of the things that I feel most uh, good about in terms of the way this turned out was the dedication of the thousands of scientists in six countries that agreed to work together on this project and to put all that information on the internet every 24 hours without claiming any patents on it uh, and making sure that anybody who had a good idea had unfettered access to the information. And that really has become the ethic now of the genome field, not just for the sequence, but for lots of other data sets that we're generating. This is an open access model. The Human Genome Project got underway in 1990. It was rather controversial at first. A lot of people thought that this couldn't be done or that it would cost more money than was actually being projected or that it would be so boring that nobody who was a good scientist would want to work on it. I'm glad that part didn't turn out to be true, at least I don't think it did, because I got the chance to work with some of the best and brightest scientists of the generation who really got totally carried away with the vision of what this project was all about. This was historic. We only had to do this once in all of human history, and they could be part of that, and they were, and they did a fabulous job. The early parts of the project were devoted to trying to build technologies that were capable of handling a genome the size of ours, also building maps of it at lower resolution, and working on model organisms that had simpler genomes uh, so that we could begin to learn how to do this. And that went pretty well, although there was lots of white knuckles at various points because we really were kind of making this up as we went along and we had made a promise to get this done in 15 years without any assurances that that was going to be possible at the time. But by the second half of the project, things really got rolling. Uh, we were able to scale up the effort based on that experience and new technologies and by 1999 we were sequencing a thousand base pairs a second, seven uh, days a week, 24 hours a day. And so by 2000, uh, there was a draft sequence in hand. By February of 2001, that was published. And by April of 2003, the finished human genome was then available on the web uh, with an accuracy of no more errors than one out of every 100,000 base pairs, a truly very high standard uh, for the sequence. What do we learn from this? Well, I could go on much longer than we have time to go through all of the interesting uh, twists and turns that came out of having this instruction book in front of us. I'll just mention a very short list. One that surprised a lot of people is just how few genes we have. We've been talking about the gene count for human beings for quite a while as being about 100,000. It's a very back of the envelope estimate, but nobody thought it would be that wrong. And now that the dust is settled and we have the sequence, uh, there's still a little bit of tweaking around the edges here because the computers are not ideally suited to find a gene and be sure it's a gene. But the total number of human genes is only about 20,000 which is a remarkably small number when you consider the complexity of our organism. So clearly the, each of these genes must be doing a lot of things. This is daunting and some people even in the religious community got a little upset about this because it turns out that 20,000 is also the gene count for a roundworm and <laughs> it's not a whole lot more than the gene count for a fruit fly and <laughs> there are some organisms like rice for instance that have more genes than we do and so at dinner tonight, there were things on your plate that had more genes uh, than you do. Uh, but you know what? That's okay. Uh, obviously, our complexity must have something more to do with other things than just counting up the number of genes. It obviously works, and none of those other organisms have sequenced their own genome. Okay. Right? Okay. <laughs> Another thing we learned by studying not just a single individual because the public project was sequencing DNA from multiple individuals, all of whom are anonymous donors. We don't know who they are and they don't know who they are because we collected DNA from a much larger group than we actually used and we did that on purpose, is that we're all an awful lot alike. Uh, your DNA and mine are 99.9% .9 the same. Regardless of which of you I picked, that would be true. So we really are part of a family uh, in a sense that few other species could claim. So if you look at all these kids here with all of their different uh, modes uh, of dress and different skin color and hair texture, uh, you might conclude that these are all very different folks. Well, they're 99.9% .9 the same. Yeah? 